right. Welcome to What's Your Voyage, a podcast where we have people on that are up to stuff and we have a chat about the voyage of their life. Enjoy. Welcome to What's Your Voyage. I'm Hamish McLaughlin, Lesser, your host. I have Owen Haig, who is our video man, and tonight he's our audio engineer as well. He's doubling it up. Brother, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm, I'm good, man. We've got the one and only, the man that has been a DJ around the nation. He has also been a coach for many in their lives. He's also been with the ABC as a reporter and a whole bunch of other stuff. He is a magician in many ways. He just pulls these other <laughs> skills out of the hat. We have no other than Troy yeah. Sincock. <laughs> Hello, Hamish. I was actually thinking about that on the way here. I'm like, what am I actually? And I couldn't come up with the answer. It was a short trip, though. I only had 15 minutes. So I, I've still I got came time up to with think. the answer for you. Magician. No, you're human. That's it. Yeah, I like that. It's a guy. He's a human. And you yeah. do shit that it's, you like. It's true. I'm alive. I'm breathing. And I'm capable of things. And I do those things. Facts. We had Corey Batwell. He's like a coach, personal development coach and stuff. And he was saying last night, how it's just so wild how a human can ingest food and then it like suck the nutrients out of that and and we get fuel from food and we do it like multiple times a day yeah it's just it's wild he was saying it's very spiritual but i was just thinking like that's just wild isn't it incredible what we take for granted that we just don't think about it because you're taught that things are a certain way and you just go through the process without giving it a second thought but yeah when you really stop and Think about that. How does that happen? Right? And it really works too. It does work. <laughs> Although, in comparison to like a car, that mm. gets way more miles. Yeah, that, that is <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> but you wouldn't want to be in any of the cars that I've driven over time. But they're generally not going that well. <laughs> <laughs> Just puff it out, smoke out the back. <laughs> Radiator's leaking. Yeah. yeah. It's funny you say that about, the, um, about how we ingest food though because I've started really for the very first time in my life looking at my health and so I'm, I'm really active and gee, what a gift that has been. But what I realize is, you know, it really isn't just about getting out there and doing the exercise. You know, it is, it's everything, you know, that you know, needing to um, eat things that then work with, you know, however you're exercising, you know, so you're, you're constantly being refueled. And uh, it really is the first time in my life that I've, I've taken a look at how to keep this machine running. Yeah, what what have you found has been working for you? Uh, well, it's, you know, the gift has been far greater than just the exercise itself. In fact, it, it happened because I was managing a radio station um, where the average age of people was 75. That's and not fresh. No, that, that wasn't fresh. Um, that was called 5MBS. It was only um, for a year. And it wasn't uh, my favourite experience. But I tell you, the gift it gave me was seeing all these 75-year-olds who'd highly accomplished people that have worked very hard in their lives. And there was this experience of, you know, if I work hard, then I'll get to enjoy my life later. If, you know, if I perform well, if I'm successful, I can really um, then go on holidays and do things like that. But what it looked like for a lot of people was that they were caring for parents in their 90s. So here you were with these, you know, 75-year-old people who often had put their health on the back burner to do the work that they were doing. And then they were starting to deal with health concerns and then you had um, their parents that were dealing with health concerns. And it just made me think that if I need to look after or care for uh, a parent or, you know, if I, if I need to have more time and energy available to do something for a loved one, I'm going to need to make sure that I'm capable of that. Because at times, you know... It, you sort of feel like your current life is difficult to manage. And I, I was thinking if, if I have to add something like that um, that could, you know, have a bit of uh, emotional strain as well, I better be ready for it. And um, so I really started uh, taking that on. But the, the gift um, that it has been has far surpassed just the, um, you know, the, the physical ease in doing things. I largely did it. I started doing it. It's in Light Square in the city and uh, it's run by a guy called Chris. It's called Chi Train. Uh, he was an ex-footballer, but that kind of diminishes him because he's far more than that. You know, he really is there in, in service of people. And I realised that we were just such a great match. And when I met him, I realised I don't need to know anything else about this. I feel held up and like I'll really get results. And um, He was like a guide for you. Yeah, like I would say a coach too. He's the kind of person where 
say if you were dealing with something in your life, you probably could have that conversation with him as well. He's just completely available to you. Um, and it's that experience of sort of uh, him taking your hand and then guiding you towards whatever it is that you want to achieve. And, and so for all the people that participate, that that's different. And I'm actually one, one of the younger participants. Um, but just the, uh, the gift it's been mentally has been incredible. Yeah, and, just like less racy. Yeah. And the connection, the connection to place has been really powerful because Light Square is, is an area that I just drive past all the time or walk through hurriedly mm-hmm. to get somewhere else. I'd never just sort of been in the space. And, you know, when I first started doing it, you realise that there are cars driving around the perimeter. Like, if I'm struggling with something, everyone's going to see this. And then I realise, no one cares. They're driving past getting to wherever they need to get to. They're not worried about me. This is just a piece of a piece of land in the middle of the city. And, um, yeah, it's just a, a sense of feeling really centred. And, um, you know, I never... It's a good pun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I never want to do it. But you get there because of, you know, the benefits that you get from it and just the sense of community, you know, the people that you get to meet that you wouldn't otherwise meet. Um, And I think we all sort of, that's the commonality. We all share whatever we're getting out of it, uh, the connection between everyone as they're pursuing those things. Um, And like you created at the beginning of this conversation, you just get to be with a series of human beings doing whatever they're doing in fact you don't really care what they're doing with their lives they're just there with you doing whatever they're doing yeah it's like that shared like hey so it's tai chi it's not tai chi no it's called it's called chi train now i don't know what the is that when you're going like yeah that that's what you're doing looks vaguely like tai chi not quite like the lady that i see doing (laughs) it in uh, north adelaide regularly but slower like no it's just uh it's all sorts of fitness so you know it can be running one day it can be uh using uh weights another time um yeah it's it's all sorts of uh, oh, so it's like a stuff. full body just like activity getting healthy getting fit yeah cardio weights like a good mix yeah ex- exactly um yeah that's but good. it's fun it's actually fun and it's outside and we, you know in winter you do it during the rain mm. and you just don't care because the benefits far outweigh you getting wet facts i've been taking on a physical challenge which is doing mount lofty every weekend yeah great and that's been awesome especially the day when it was raining yes because it was like i felt like a beast <laughs> you know? I, just, I was like yeah i'm doing this it's wet and i just went harder yeah you, know, it's just, you just it's good tapping into that that beast inside and being like i'm gonna challenge it yeah, yeah. you know the first time someone suggested that uh, i join them um i thought this is this is going to be great because i know many people that do that regularly and i thought (gasps) yeah yeah well he he was smaller than me and i assumed far less fit um i knew broadly speaking he was yeah less healthy (laughs) oh man that first time wow yeah right just going too hard too early i think oh was that the last time no no i kept going but not uh, with him did you time it uh yeah he got there like 20 what, minutes earlier 20? than i did i know it wait, took wait. me some what did, time what did you get what's like your fastest time there do you know of? no i don't really keep it uh tabs but it would you know i don't go too quick it's more about just doing it, right. it to yeah, the top. i don't know maybe like 40 minutes or something like that i don't run it or anything though yeah, i'm yeah. just walking you know walking. yeah yeah, yeah. Fair. but, it, but t- take a look at that is a mental game my goodness you know firstly i kind of struggled because i went too hard not really knowing what the journey was going to look like. So there was no planning. I didn't, I, he'd not created how that was going to look. I just didn't, I thought we were just walking, walking up some mountain. And because other people that I know that have done it, I'm like, well, they're not super fit. They're just ordinary people. Yeah, there's heaps of them. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I would definitely be able to do this. But then, of course, you work out what it is. And then you have to decide, am I going to do this again? You <laughs> eventually do it again with more strategy. But what's interesting is now that you, I know exactly how it goes. There are those parts where I'm already saying to myself, oh, I really don't want to get to that, but that part's <laughs> going to be so hard. Uh, so, you know, you just notice the mind playing tricks on you and, mm. you know, some days are better than others, but it's generally the mental thing that takes me out. Yeah. Mm. I've been taking like a, like a, like a, who's his name? Tony Goggins. Tony Goggins. Oh, you know Goggins. You heard of Goggins? No. Oh, he's this wild guy. He essentially has like gone through all the American trainings of like SEAL, Air Force, Navy, like all of them. Yeah. He's done all of them and he's done like these crazy ultra marathons and he's just like get hard, push yourself to the limit, pass the limit, like break your ankle, keep going, like crazy guy. Okay. 
Um, and he inspired why we're doing these big walks as well. But taking that like dog mentality and just like when it's harder, leaning into that and being like, that's what I'm here for. Yes. And yes. like emb- fully embracing that, even when you're like, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And like responding to that voice in your head saying, I don't want to do that. Like, and being excited, the fact that you're having that experience yes. and like leaning into it. Well, I don't know that excited is a word that I would use for that experience for me just yet, but I don't ever give up. If I, like being the advers, like your conscious mind being the adversary to that yeah. just like automatic mind. You're like, yeah, I'm going to beat you. Yeah. You know, like as a competitive. I think you've just given edge. me something for next time I'm in that space. I'm going to really try that on because yeah. sometimes it is just like a, it's a wrestling match. Oh, it's have for a Hamish sure. and you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I'm going to be picturing Hamish right now. I'm great. You can do it. <laughs> All right, so let's go way back mm. and let's like go through like you know what you've actually been doing with your life mm-hmm. aside from occasionally walking out lofty. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, it's you know there's there's a lot, so it's probably hard to put into a few words. But I, it's all right. We got time. Okay. If I be, if I begin at the very beginning, it's funny how there are things that I only see now that I just wasn't present to when I was younger, but, and perhaps it's because, you know, um, my dad is dealing with his health at the moment as he continues to get older. He's completely fine, by the way, but he got diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer at the end of last year and he's dealt with heart trouble over time and and that seems to be quite a genetic thing in our family. My mum had a quadruple bypass and my brother, who's younger than me, has encountered some some trouble. My uncle uh, dropped it at the age of 50 suddenly. Um and so that's just what it looks like. So you can actually take on that's a bit of a gift. It's good to know where to look. Um, yes, that's and, been a big thing in my family. Like my mum got her ovaries like taken out because of ovarian cancer. It was like a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. A few people. yeah. yeah. It's so – that kind of thing is so invasive. Yeah, it's and scary. Yeah, has people be really, really vulnerable. Um, and, you know, I, I collapsed a couple of years ago and, uh, and they didn't really – I went through all these tests and they didn't uh, have any answers. But every time I go to the doctor and they check my heart, I'm just waiting for them at some point to go, hey, look, you know, your time's up now. But they, they keep saying to me, oh, your heart's great. And I, I'm always – are you like, sure? Are, are check you should check that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were like, no, seriously. So I'm, I've started to look at it and go, wow, I really, where I am in life, so I'll turn 48 this year, I really could, I'm starting to look at it like I could really get to 100. If I keep going, I have never lived like this. I've truly thought of somewhere between 50 and 70, I'm falling off the perch. But what? ever since I've taken on my health and everything, I'm started to go, hang on, I might only be halfway there. So whatever I'm about to tell you, I'm halfway there. So it all it all really began with dad. That's why I, I raised um, dad because he was a well known cricketer, and I, so I grew up with a dad that was well known. So you go to school, everyone knew him. You know, the kids that I went to school with would watch him on the television. He was on in the, like the Australian team. No, he was in the South Australian team at a time when state cricket was big. Yeah, you know, it really was. They didn't play nearly as much. Um, uh, you know, test match cricket and, and that kind of thing as, as they do now. And um, it was kind of the equivalent of playing for the Crows, really. You know, that's what it would have been like um, for him then. And so these people that played in the state team, they were all well-known, really. And there's a lot of great players that um, came through the team. You know, Ian Chappell was his um, was the captain. Yep, yep. Um, you know, David Hooks played with him, yep. um, those, those kind of people. And... Um, you know, just having that dad just made everything else possible. And I've not really realised that until I've got a little bit older because, you know, I played cricket as a high level in the juniors, as did my brother. And we, people would constantly say to us that we were talented and I don't believe that anymore. Because then, because it wouldn't be said to that many people, you know, just a couple of people in the team, you'd have the really strong players and everyone else who was just sort of making up the team. But I was quite shy and humble too, so I wasn't fully present to anything, but I knew that I wanted to do well and I knew that I did well. Um, but even if I did well, I still wanted to do better than that, so I was quite, you know, kind of driven to be competitive. But um, I think the, re- the reason I was good was I repetitively did something Excellent. for a long time. 
Yep. Yeah. So I basically, you know, I came out of the womb and I was already had a ball and bat in my hand. I mean, you would have also had the context that like you're naturally going to be good at it because your dad's good at it and you probably want to prove your love to your dad a bit because like he was really good at it and you're like, if I'm good at this, my dad's going to be like, yeah, you're fucking good at this. <laughs> yeah. I think that also has definitely, um, has had some influence in how things have gone for me because, you know, as a younger person, you just do what you do and, you know, it's great that you can do something well. I think everyone really just wants to do something well. So True. the fact that I had that and I could draw really well and those kind of things, I was like, wow, I've got a couple of things. This is, this is excellent. Um, but I, uh, I, in my teenage years, I definitely started to resent that because I was, I didn't get to choose this. And it wasn't like I was ever forced to do anything, but I was, hang on, I didn't make this choice for myself. I've just kind of gone on autopilot because I can do something well. Of cricket or, or drawing? Uh, cricket. Okay. Drawing was the only thing that I really had to myself, but my brother was al was also good. So I, I sort of never had that one thing. So cutting a, a very long story short in terms of my, um, my youth, it was going to high school and discovering drama that changed everything for me. And I think that was, you know, that was my thing. There was no one else in the family um, that was even remotely into that kind of stuff. Um, but I think perhaps it was a bit of an extension of performing, like in cricket or sort of getting results. You know, you'd be in front of people doing whatever you were doing. And then I think um, drama didn't feel, feel that different to me. I knew what it was like to, um, to perform well or, you know, to be able to give the type of performance that other people appreciated as well. So it was it was discovering drama that made a huge difference for me, and also it introduced me to a lot of different people. Because if you take a look at what it was like in locker rooms, yeah, it's a certain way of being that there's not too many differences between people. It's kind of like a group mentality. Yeah, it's kind of you better be this way to fit in. In fact, mm. it became a challenge for me because uh, my dad. Um, and mum separated when I was 10 and then uh, I, so I lived with my mum I'd see my dad every couple of weeks and of course we, he corresponded uh, throughout that period but I was there uh, with my mum and obviously she was very influential in my life and so I started being taught the female side of things yeah and so I was kind of brought up very much with that mentality and I had a, a younger uh, sister as well it's a lot of feminine energy around you yeah it was very much like that and I think so I'd hear something at home about how things should be and then I'd be in a locker room and it would be the exact opposite and it always felt kind of weird. It felt like having one foot in, one foot out. I feel that same way because mm. I grew up with mum. Yeah. And like for like 90% of – like over 90% of my youth. And yeah, I felt the same like in terms of fitting in with like boy culture mm. and it was like, oh, like – I was like, had this idea of like, my mum raised me as this like gentleman, like this is how you treat women. This is how you, uh, so I had all these like built up uh, like social, um, what do you call them? Like ideas mm. that I had to abide by. And then I had all these other people that I was hanging out with that didn't have those. And they go, why are you abiding by those things? Why are you speaking like that? Why are you, you know, yeah. like why are you constraining yourself Yes. From just like being brash. Yes. And I was like, I didn't know. It took me a while to like break that down and be like, oh, it's okay to be brash every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I ever really kind of got that. And the funny thing is my dad is, um, how do I just put it into words? Charismatic is probably the best way I can say it. And he's a very fancy dresser. As well, he's very known for well known for his haircut and the way he dresses. And uh, he can walk into a room just with those things alone and people assume he's someone important. Yeah. Um, so I kind of uh, grew so up. I want to be player. like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, not really. Again, I was kind of rejecting it, but I, but now that I, uh, you know, I'm older, I realize I've, I'm him. Yeah. I com I'm completely <laughs> him in every aspect. Like <laughs> all the things I don't like. Yep. That's over there with me. Yes. Everything I love, I hope is here with me as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, and then I sort of started feeling quite conflicted. I think really, Probably more than wanting to um, go my own course, I, I truly do believe now that it was the discomfort of being in those situations and feeling very torn about the environment that I was in. Like locker room versus drama world. Yeah. I remember at cricket practice one time, I broke a guy's foot um, when I bowled to him. and Like when you hit it with the bowl and it broke his foot? Yeah, I bowled a Yorker and it hit him on the foot. Wow. Because I was competitive in the nets as well. When I say competitive, I was just trying to do well. I mean, I never wanted to hurt anyone. And that accidentally happened. 
And it was really hard for me in that team because even though he wasn't playing, any sort of time that the, uh, the cricket team got together as a community, like I never felt like I'd be there fully. Like he was real angry with me and he was one of those, you know, super macho kind of guys. And uh, your dad was and he was like a sideliner, like yeah, trying well, to make you do better. No, dad was dad was fine. You know, he he was supportive. I don't think. Wait, who are you talking about right now? I'm talking ta- about that other person in. Cricket? I'm talking about the guy whose foot I broke. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was. He wasn't great with me, and it was <laughs> it was really hard to be with because you know I was used to being liked, and I think really that's why I gave it away because I was like I don't know if I can, <laughs> like this feels like your teammate, well, it was like a teammate turning on you. It's like I'm not I'm not willing to. To be like this, um, went down the wrong way. The water, no oh, worries. Oh my lord! <laughs> so I, th- I really think it probably was that. But then at the same time, then I'm getting involved in drama, mm. and then you have all these people. It was largely females, and then the guys that w- were really getting into it largely had that feminine energy as well. In fact, what I realised later on in life, most of my best best male friends who I really developed around that time ended up being gay. Um, but I just I wasn't aware of anything. We were just all doing the things that uh, that we that we love. But I definitely felt more at home that way, and um, and it was hard because not hard. It was just there was something to reconcile because I'd gone from being really popular and well liked to then being part of the misfits, but not deliberately. I was just doing the things that I loved doing. But it was really interesting to see when I started to pursue the arts, how people that had really embraced me in sport wanted nothing to do with me. Mm. And I remember even working at a checkout um, when I worked at high school and then the mother of a child that went to the same school as me asked what I was up to. And I talked about doing some extracurricular drama stuff as well and told them who I was involved in doing that with. And... You could. They just immediately defaulted to that. Uh, you know, I was gay, or that I was part of some world. And I could, I, even though I wasn't completely conscious of all of those things, I got that people started being different with me when I talked proudly about something that I really loved. And it, you know, my whole friendship group changed, and all of that kind of thing. But also, you gained a whole another friendship group too. And um, yeah, it was just that change of trying on a whole different version of your personality and different self expression. Yeah, and then the people that you were with, you kind of like outgrew them. Yes, and as I say, as I'm talking about this, because I, you know, I having this conversation with you is giving me the opportunity to see something just in in what I'm saying. I don't sit around thinking about these things at all. Um, but really, from from that point forward, I've pretty much champion the misfit you know it's it's been i've been quite drawn to wanting to give people a leg up um like disadvantaged people or you mean like no, people just, that just had like a very individualistic expression yeah people like uh, your artists and stuff like that that yeah you know were proud of like i'm intentionally being different in life because that's how i want to be yeah, well, I don't think a lot of those people are. I think that they just are different. Um, and also, you know, you have the people that think by being a certain way, then, you know, there are people that also want to be part of that group too. True. You know? Yeah, and I meant intentionally, like, it's like intentional of like, that's my calling. So I'm going to be how I want to be kind of thing. Not necessarily like out proud about it because obviously there's introverted people yeah. that are that, but it's like, that's just like what it is as opposed to how they're thinking about it. Yeah, I think it was more about um, really starting to see wouldn't it be great if everyone just got to express themselves however they wanted to express themselves. Yeah, that's fair. So how did you start to interact with that world? Obviously, you did drama, you finished school. What did you, yeah. what did you start doing then? So I that's did when it ramps up, right? Yeah, well, I did all of those things. I was just one of those um, guys that didn't really know what he wanted to do but knew what I loved. But I was constantly told that the things that I enjoyed most were either hard to do or you would never get a job. I distinctly remember the, the drama teacher in year 12 who I loved just because he was just, you know, he was the teacher of the class that I loved most and he was just good with everyone. Mm. And he came around one time. This may not have been what was said, but it, it's certainly what I recalled. 
And so whenever I recount this, it's, it's always said in the same way. He came around and said, Department of Education has told us to tell you stop doing this because there are no jobs. It was something to that effect. It's so rough. Yeah, and I was, no, but I really want to do this. Yeah. I was upset. Fair enough. I, like, I finally found this thing that's mine. And now this guy that I'm really respecting, who I'm sure he had no sense of the impact it had on me at all and I've never spoken to him about it since. Um, but, yeah, that sense of being told you can't do something. So this that plays into how I am as well because, yeah, don't say that to me yeah, or I'll, that, I'll show you. <laughs> don't tell me what to do. That's how I'm going to go do it. Yeah. I think yeah. also that some of those things too um, uh, just managed to build up a lot of resilience for me as well like i got that if i was going to play that game Mm. it was not going to be the easy game to play and if you wanted to do it you'd have to really throw yourself at it and so that's what i did cool so and then you started djing is that where you went from there and i started radio and then i got into djing from there because people assumed that i was a dj So so where'd you start radioing so the radio thing happened because in year 12 the moderator said you've got a great voice and I had no idea that I did. I didn't not really know how I sp- spoke other than when I would learn uh, lines for drama, I would read the other characters' lines onto a cassette tape. And then once those lines were said, I'd hit pause, I'd say my line, and I'd hit play again, and then it would continue. And that's how I would learn my lines. And so I'd hear my voice on the cassette player, and that, that was it was not like it was me. It was like it was someone else's voice. And I remember I was best man at my dad's wedding at 14 and they filmed this. <laughs> and I'm reading out telegrams um, from well-known people and other well wishes. And you know when you get a glimpse of yourself from outside yourself, you're like, oh, my goodness. Like, yeah, you're <laughs> oh, just man, is that me? It? Yeah, I was like, yeah. this is not okay. Um, but then when the, teachers, uh, when the moderator said that, I was like, well, <laughs> what do I know? You know, if that's the feedback they're giving me, maybe there's something there. And so really that was what had me um, look at doing radio because I didn't know what I wanted to do after school. I got into uh, teaching, but I only put that down because we were kind of forced to put something down. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, so I did this um, 10-week radio course. It was the Vaughan Harvey Radio School on uh, Peary Street. And it was all sorts of people in that. I didn't really know what I was doing other than... I, you know, I liked listening to the radio or would tape songs off the radio because I love music and I'd stay up late listening to American Top 40 and I liked the idea of being one of the guys that was the voiceover for the radio station rather than the host. I thought that was really cool. Anyway, I did the, the course and um, the prize for the course was you get your fees refunded and you get a trophy. And I, and I did it and I met some people there that um, became good friends and uh, it was on the last day and I hadn't done my homework. Um but I was just clear that they were going to give me the award. I, I just knew that they were going to say me. And then uh, Leon Biner, who'd been on uh, 5AA up until recently, wearing a velvet suit from what I recall, um, announced that I was the winner. And then, when I, and then when that happened, someone in the course was doing community radio. They said, you've got to come down and be on my show. And that's how it began. Well, there you go. Mm. And then wh- so how did you flip around radio? What kind of radio is so I don't started, know all the things you've been on. Yeah, it started at Sky. It was Sky FM, which is now Coast FM. That was on O'Halloran Hill, yeah. where uh, that was where I first. I think I saw my first drive-in movie um, up there. It was out the back of a tape. Dude, tape I college. Loved drive-in movies. I can't. Be- such a vibe. They really are closing down. There's well, they're very just not few. profitable, right? No. <laughs> they're just not making money. <laughs> so it's like, you know, go, people are going. No, it, the novelty's cool but it doesn't really make any sense and there's too much infrastructure to be like we're gonna do it once a month yeah like well i think the latest one just closed down it was like the last one in mawson lakes yeah, yeah. Well, it's just it's a huge amount of space to just like be like hey once a month they'll come here with your cars like yeah, yeah. yeah unless it's like a car park in the daytime that'd be like the only way it would work if yeah. it's like designated car park yeah that's actually not a yeah. bad idea <laughs> takes up a lot of space doesn't not it not a bad idea though it's just doing it at a car park spot yeah. Near a car park, just put a huge screen there. You should get onto that. Yeah, I'm, I am the car park guy. <laughs> <laughs> you really are. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, um, I did community radio there and then I ended up get, getting given my own show with a guy who I'd done that radio course with. And the thing that really made everything work was the reason I became friends with him was he was from England and he'd experienced going to raves and I'd only read about them here. And I'd started to really develop a love of electronic music. I had a love of kind of 
black music for want of a better description, kind of African American music. Like what kind of music? They like funk, it like, soul. It was mainly neo soul, hip hop. Yeah. Like what are we talking? So it's... it wouldn't radio music first. So kind of the the R and B and hip hop that was making it to the radio. That's and why what, I listened to when American we, what Top Forty. Decade 40. was this? This would have been uh, like very nice. early nineties, late eighties. Oh, okay, so you were like LL Cool J times. Yes, yep. Yeah. I loved him. A Tribal Quest, all the yeah. all the golden era stuff. Yeah. Did and you get into the West Coast, like Snoop Dogg? Yeah, but not as much. I really like... I mean, East Coast? Yeah, I okay. love, love New York. Um, yeah, New York's but cool. That was why I listened to American Top 40, because the way it worked then was... So this show was on late on a Sunday night, and I'd sit in my bed with headphones plugged into a cassette player to listen to American Top 40. It was well after I was supposed to be in bed. Cassette? And, yeah. So what, you recorded it? Oh, I've got a story about that. We may not have time for that, but there, oh, something <laughs> terrible happened to me with the cassette player that... People didn't believe when I went to school the next day. Anyway, I um, and I'd listen to it. The way the, um, the radio and record industry worked then was when you heard American Top 40, it literally was, oh, these are the songs that will soon be big in Australia. So it was a way of getting the new music first. And so I would love this stuff. I'd go and to school and tell my friends about it, and you know there was a few of us that yeah, would you'd listen. Be like the tastemaker as well, so it's like that's right. A vibe. So, but then you'd be hungry to buy this stuff, and you couldn't buy it, and until it came into the shops and all that kind of thing. So you'd be using this little cassette that you you taped, and you yeah, would have rewound over and over again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and you know, when I started buying records in high school, then buying R and B records on the other side, there'd be house mixes of R and B songs for the club. And so that's when really? my interest in yeah electronic music started. And then I was you know I was reading lots and going to these record stores and hearing music I didn't necessarily like, but like wow, there's something else going on here. And also the kids in uh, design in year twelve when I was in year eleven would bring in this ghetto blaster and play this sort of rave music and things like Guru Josh Infinity and stuff like that. And I'd be like, wow, that it literally feels like the future. Like what is that? So I had this thirst for that. So when it came to doing the uh, radio show with this guy from England too who had some knowledge and I was just enthusiastic. Then we uh, put together this electronic music show and at that point there was only a couple on, yeah, on so radio at all. Like a, what time slot was it? Midnight till 2 o'clock Sunday morning. Sunday morning. So okay. midnight Saturday night. So what's ridiculous is the music we loved. Oh, midnight Saturday. Oh, that's like the perfect time. Yeah, it is because people were driving to go to parties yeah. and things like that or coming home or whatever. So it was perfect. But, of course, we never really got to fully participate <laughs> because we were doing the damn show. But we got known as a result and, uh, you know, so you get free tickets to things and I eventually started writing for Street Press and, you know, and from there we started DJing. What was street Press? Uh, it was like the core magazine, Onion Magazine, which was in the middle of uh, Rip It Up magazine. There was a f- I think there may have been one other, and there, there have been many others since then, but that was probably uh, at the very beginning. And was that Australia-wide? Was no, that, that was only South Australian. Yeah, okay. But again, at that point, you know, the, in South Australia, like we had everything we needed. That We were right there on the edge of it because of, you know, techno here in um, South Australia uh, had an enormous name for itself globally. Did it? Yeah. When um, Dirty House Records began, it was all led by HMC pretty much. And that's a record label? Yeah, HMC is, is Late Night Tough Guy. So uh, Cam BM Chetty is his name. And uh, late, uh, HMC... Housemaster C was how he came up with the name. Is Housemaster Cam HMC? He would just ruled the roost here. Like when he played, it was like going to see an international every weekend. Like That's where sweet. he played, it was sold out. Um, you couldn't get in. You wanted to get in. All the coolest people were there. It was just awesome, and he continues to be that way too. He's just incredible. He gets to tour the the world now, uh, doing that. But he was just really there at the ground floor of techno. And then the, a record label was created around, you know, that kind of output called uh, Dirty House Records. Then that became a movement in itself. And then the you know, guys in Detroit started seeing what was happening here and the people in Europe and they were like, wow, what's this Adelaide? Probably thinking it was some metropolis. But, of course, a little bit like Detroit, really, it was kind of, you know, the underdog you know, yeah. music, really. Um, yeah, but, you know, I just... I found that stuff so exciting because it was so otherworldly and, you know, much like discovering drama and all these other things that, you know, I see in life, it was an opportunity to, I don't know, a combination of sort of escaping or, it's said another way, not having to be a particular thing to participate. There was kind of like a community 
built into it. So when you were in the parties, it was like a safe space. Mm. And so it was kind of like a come as you are, but the thing that bonded everyone was the music. And I, you know, I wouldn't say I was like super connected other than people knew that I was doing the radio thing. I, I, I didn't, I couldn't go up to the cool people and say hello or I didn't hang out with them or whatever. I was very much an observer. Yeah, but you on the radio, so they didn't know you by the face. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, which is probably a good thing, to be honest. <laughs> Started talking, they're like, is that the radio guy? We don't know, we don't know who it looks like. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, Corey, who I was doing that radio show with, he started DJing because we would buy records then to play on the on the radio show. Yep. And uh, I wasn't – I had a very brief flirtation being an MC at parties that didn't go well. <laughs> um, and then – uh, him and I uh, lived together and then that got a bit too much because we were just with each other all the time. And um, it was when we stopped living together, I'm like, I wonder if I could do this. And then I realised I just could innately do it because I'd been around it for so long. Yeah, so you uh, just had the rhythm. Yeah, I, I didn't take long to uh, teach just myself how to beat match. the actual, the technology. Yeah, so. I'm still technically pretty ordinary in terms of the, the actual equipment um, that we use. But what I do have now is... Just, I'm really proud of the ear that I have. It's um, I begin to realize that you know I, I have taste, and that's the thing that obviously people. I realized want. that in my like late teens, I was like, dude, I've got great taste. I'm keen for the world to see what my taste looks like in the world. Like, yeah, it's it's a thing. You, yeah, it having is. good taste. And then obviously being able to create something so then other people can recognise that is, is a cool thing. Particularly the world we're in now too, isn't it? Because, you know, you guys, like you get to, you can be a curator. Whereas oh, yeah. once upon a time the only curators existed <laughs> people in museums and art galleries. Yeah, well there was like, you know, there's more gatekeepers. But that's coming back. It is coming back with the change of all these algorithms and whatnot compared yeah. to like, say, 10 years ago or like seven years ago. Yeah, I can see The that. gatekeepers are definitely building up with social media's algorithms. Yeah. And you're like, for example, TikTok, you like start to gain some notoriety on TikTok and then you become a part of a TikTok community where you actually have a direct relationship with TikTok and that will tell you what the next trends are. Yeah, So gotcha. then you're just like being a part of the, the machine of creating the next trends. Yeah, yeah. As I, opposed to like... It's a pretty mm. powerful tool. Yeah, that's wild. But it's like, it's not... It's not organic. No, I, you know, where we've arrived at the conversation now really has me see how much I'm very sort of pro human being and very resistant to some other things. I wouldn't say I'm anti technology at all. Like, I think you know, some things have become very easy to do. But when things being easy is the reason for doing it, it fundamentally removes that sort of that passion or that what it takes to create something special i think it is best done when there's some barrier or when the canvas is only so wide you know i've always loved constraints like creating within constraints I, that is my favorite thing to do and that's what i love about um djing and having developed that taste and when i say the taste it's really the confidence in my own taste. It's the confidence that when I think something's good, if I back it in, I can make it work. That's really it. And I love doing that because then that gives someone else the opportunity to discover what I discovered. And that's really all, the only reason I'm doing it because I want people to hear this stuff. I'm not doing this to look cool or for things not to be heard or to keep it to myself. I want I want the things I love in life to be commonplace. Mm. Isn't it so cool when you have those unexpected like pairings, for example, like two mm. records and... And like someone's listening, they're like, oh, and then, you know, you bring it in with the other thing. They're like, what the hell? Yeah. How the hell did this guy just do that? It's yeah. like we're back in the day with like those white panda remixes. Yes. Doing like all the Eminem and stuff like that. They were just crazy. Yeah. Like they were just like, how is this working so goddamn well? It's really awesome. And I, the way I look at it is look, like you created at the very beginning of this conversation. We're all human beings. If we're on the earth, most of the things that are available to you are available to me. And certainly if you're in different socioeconomic um, circumstances or in different places in the world, perhaps there are limitations to that to some degree. But if you're in there with other people, what's available to you is largely available to the people in your community. Yes. You know, it's all, it's, it's all there for the taking. And 
but having more of that or less of that doesn't really make the difference is what you do with whatever you have available to you so when i'm um the way i've carved a niche for myself as someone that plays music is by just backing myself in having confidence and doing it for the right reasons mm. not that there is a right or wrong reason but the but I, i'm always here to further something and it goes back to that sort of you know championing people that you know perhaps aren't you know fully heard or you know that their i think their expressions can be loud and wanting people to um to be exposed to that it's the it's the same thing so i'm not when i'm playing music i'm not thinking about impressing you or trying to play something you like or the the hottest new thing i'm literally just creating an experience for you and I, I hasten to use the word experience but that is effectively it this is the context this is this is what i do this is the only thing i do so once upon a time when i was djing it used to be a bit of a hobby for me and i was afraid to step in but when i stopped managing fresh then there was like djing right there and i'm like i, can, I could do this for a period of time i continue making money while i work out the other things that i'm going to do and you know it's great that i have this but then i soon realized that this is my opportunity like I'm either going to do it or I'm not going to do it. And it got to a point where I was like, let me just try this on and see if I could really do it. And you'd worked in all sorts of different situations and some of those have not been enjoyable and some have been great and just taking a look at all those kind of things. And What do you mean, like bad clubs, good clubs? Yeah, yeah, sometimes the environment just not events yeah. that you're like, oh, I don't really work at like a bar mitzvah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, but having experienced those things is really great because then you start to work out what it is. But yeah. this is what I do when I'm DJing. I walk into a, a space, I change it, and when I leave, it's never the same. That's it. That's all I do. So whether I'm coming in at the beginning of the night and someone's already creating something or if I come in when there's literally no one in the venue and I started from scratch or if I'm you know ending it, that's all I do. There's a space, I walk into it, I change it, and when I leave, it's never the same. That's all I do. That's pretty cool. It is cool because that's what it keeps it interesting for me because it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. My job here is to put my stamp on what's going on, and it's, and it's not to be better than the, the person that was playing before. Or It's always better, though. <laughs> well, it's, it's, actually, it's, always it's not, better. but it is different. It is different. It is uniquely different. Because obviously you want to raise the vibes, right? That's like... Part of the goal. Not necessarily. No, I'm... I, oh, you don't want to leave people being like, oh, crying and shit. Like, you want good no. vibes going on because, like... Yeah. You, you know, the people coming to dance for, you notice, like, chats are getting, like, more passionate and stuff like that. Yeah. Is that kind of the things you look out for? Yeah, de definitely. Because when you don't know what you're doing, when you're trying to impress people or if you're doing what you think needs to be done, what you do in those situations is just provide more energy. So it's kind of like if a DJ is struggling and there's no one on the dance floor, what they'll do is either play something that's so obvious that it'll get someone on the dance oh, floor. I'm or, a lady. <laughs> oh, good lord! It's often worse than that, Hamish. Um, <laughs> or what they'll do is is like really push the tempo. So you, you start playing music that's flat out, thinking, "Oh, maybe it's you know, maybe it's because there's less energy in the room. I just need to add more energy." In my view, none of those things work. Once you step into either of those things, you're on a hiding to nothing. You know how it's going to go. You're going to be a slave to the circumstances and it's not going to be fun. Yeah, but you, if you play a hit, right, you're going to have to keep playing the hits because that's why now they've come to the dance floor. And then yeah. you can't start like yeah. playing, I don't know, the kind of music you want to play. Yeah, so it's it's really how you play it. And so you begin to – my what I try and do is just have people spend a really – long time in the space and if that means at the times they stop dancing i'm completely fine with that because i don't think that actually assists the business i realize that i'm working for the business too so my job is to have that business thrive as well as people enjoy themselves yeah so they need to step away from the dance floor yeah they some, need to buy booze that's right <laughs> absolutely 100 percent. but you know a lot of a lot of people can be quite scared of that it can, can be confronting if you're in the middle of the night and people aren't dancing and you've got that sort of voice on your shoulder going, you're doing a terrible job. But this is where, you know, some of the personal development training that I've done has served me so well is because when I hear myself saying things to myself like that, I can stop listening to it. Mm. And I, I know, it's funny, when I'm watching other DJs in that situation, I, I can almost hear their internal voice and what they're saying to themselves. You can pick it a mile off. And, you know, sometimes it sees you through, but I promise you it's never rewarding and you never walk away with a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. All right. So I want to get your view 
on what you were saying before of like about technology mm-hmm. and how it is the kind of set. Because obviously, you know, you said I'm not anti-technology, mm-hmm. but I've realized I'm pro-human. What does that actually mean to you? Well, it's about if the technology enables uh, a human expression to emerge in an effective way, I think that's worthwhile. What do you mean? Okay. So I'll give you an example. So I've played records all my life because when I came up, that's what I, that's the format that was used at the time. Yeah. So, you know, there are records and cassettes and you couldn't play cassettes in clubs. Although my very first gig was using cassette only at the Aberfoyle Park Tavern at a birthday. (laughs) That takes something. Um, but, but, you know, and so I've be, become known as the record guy too. And then when uh, CDJs and other technology um, was created, people were playing music from laptops and things. Um, I was like, I'll just hold on for as long as I can and eventually, you know, this will expire f- for me. And so most people, you know, saw it. I mean, it's absolutely impractical to play records. This doesn't work. It, there's a lot of weight. You can't take every song that you own with you, all those kind of things it feels restrictive and also if you're traveling uh taking these things on a plane is going to cost you a freaking fortune um and so most people then started moving towards the other technology and i was in the minority playing records and so i just didn't step in at all but then you know meanwhile vinyl started <laughs> making a bit of a resurgence oh, that again, made a mad right? comeback yeah no, it's it's extraordinary um but what happened was i just got to a point i was like you know what I am going to expire here. My, everything that I've worked for is going to stop unless I can step in. I'm just going to have to step in. Because I was saying no to some gigs where it was only that technology available. It just simply because I was like, I, I just play records. But then I realised this is not going to work out. I'm going to need to do it. And also I realised that I was just scared of it. And oh, like learning how it all works. Yeah, I mean, I knew fundamentally. Like I'm smart enough to kind of work things out. It'd be the same way as sort of, you know, vaguely been able to navigate a computer. I'm still not very good at those kind of things, but I can kind of you know, send an email. I can, you know, I can write documents. I can, you know, put a spreadsheet together. But it's all very, very basic. But I realise I'm not really interested in it being any more comprehensive than that for me. It's not it's not what I'm up to. And so I realised the same thing about using the technology. So I said yes to a gig and I had no way of playing because I didn't have anything. And then I just picked an artist that was right in the middle of everything I liked and I just downloaded stacks of that person's music and I only took their music to play for like three hours so his name was then Joey Negro he's changed that because of these times and he he's Dave Lee which is his actual name okay so he's a white guy yeah white guy that plays disco music effectively yeah okay and v- extremely popular in that world so I just downloaded all that stuff and I just made it work and I realised no one cares they don't know that it's the same guy uh, mixing yeah, all, all these songs he had enough diversity of like sounds and stuff that yeah, it worked yeah and I, and I did that and then I realised I can do that. And it's then, a pretty wild challenge though, play like a one guy. Yeah. For like a whole set. Well, it kind of didn't fully occur to me because I was playing a game with myself. I'm like, I reckon I could do this. I don't know if it's going to work, but I reckon I could do it. Yeah, like you made it way. Like you, you could have made it way easier, but that's kind of funny that you had that like little sub challenge yeah. inside of the challenge of like, I'm doing this whole new technology, but oh, uh, I'm also gonna use one artist. Like what? <laughs> I'm still the I'm still the same though. That's what I that's what I love about it. I'm constantly playing a game with myself when I'm playing. Mm-hmm. So little yeah. challenges. I yeah. mean that's the same with like lyricists and their writing, right? Like hip hop hip hop, for example, in rap, like people set all these like little games of flows, like, oh, I'm gonna have this word rhyme throughout a whole verse is like a classic one, or like yeah. they'll have like a particular uh, three word rhyme and they will like continue that for ages yeah playing like that yeah the guys that I know that um, rhyme they uh, yeah they're really into the English language and they'll really kind of extend their vocabulary it's very much a part of kind of what they do but having more words to play with and, and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff yeah I think you've, you've got to do those kind of things but I do that it's exactly what I said before it's it's I actually view myself as a painter, as a DJ. It literally is like painting with colours. That's all I'm doing. So the records, you don't. I don't care about the detail. It's like what colour, what colour do I need now? And so then I'll just find a record that represents that colour for me, and then I play it. And then by the end of the night, hopefully, I've painted a a picture. Although I would say that. And do you actually have a picture in your mind as like at the end of the night, or is it like? No, it, like it would be very abstract. It'd be abstract, but I've, I see um, music in. Color, 
Um, and so, yeah, it does feel like painting. When I look at uh, my records, if I'm choosing music, I, I see it as well as hear it. Like you see it as like an all-pervasive colour that's like around mm. your head kind mm. of thing, like in your mind, or you see it as like a stroke or like... No, it's like, you... it's like going to one of those hardware stores and they've, you know, they've got all the, whatever they call those things, all the little squares oh, like of colour. Oh, the color. Pantones. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly like that. Oh, you see Pantones. Yeah, I, I, I do. Yeah, so there can be a lot of different <laughs> do you have, kind of do you blues have and browns. <laughs> <laughs> you got little colour cans there? No, I should. That would be really, that would actually be an interesting exercise to take one of those charts and actually apply the colour. I, I bet there'd be a whole portion of that spectrum that I wouldn't use because there are, like, I'm, I, I wouldn't play many reds or anything like that. I wouldn't play many yellows or oranges or those kind of things. It's all quite... And what, are yellow, what are yellows and oranges? Because obviously red would be more aggressive, but what's yellow yeah, and orange? I, um, heading that way. Okay. And I'm not really that way at all. What I do is quite smooth and, um, yeah. But when pe- It's funny because a guy came up to me the other night that I've known for some time and, you know, I hadn't seen him since the pandemic began and he was just asking about that, um, you yeah, know, how things been. And I'm like, actually, I really got that I had to step in. And when I stepped in, I got better. And then I realised that I can do all sorts of things. So I, I, I don't require a dance floor to get work to do what I do. Like I'm creating a, a feeling in a room all the time. And he said to me, oh, well, you're, you're lucky because you're kind of loungy. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, I get, I get it. But when someone says that to me, it's like, he, he could, elevated music. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You may as well have said that. But I was like, you know, well, if loungy to you is whatever I'm doing right now, I'm okay with that. Yeah, you call it what you what you will. I don't call it that. Triggered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I don't hear it like I don't hear it like that. You're just yeah, I your see vibes. It like colors. It's yeah. like chill vibes. It's like smooth. It's like I want people to make love to this. Yeah, it kind, of, it kind of is that. I really, I just want it to be. Um, it's like when you walk in a room and you're like, you're feeling yourself, you start talking to a girl and you're like all smooth and you're able to like get that kind of rasp in your voice and you're like, yeah, like what are you thinking? And like you start talk a little slower and shit like that. I was never like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the, like, that's the energy of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's always, if I was to pick a sort of a mood, it would be... Uh, I'd use the word sensuality. Yeah, okay, yeah. Mm, that's what I'm going that's for. That's cool. All right, so what else have you done? You're obviously mad into the DJ stuff. Oh. Yeah. Radio, radio, you know, was my thing. You know, the DJing extended from radio, but I've never stopped doing radio since that very moment that I um, went to that community radio station. I've never stopped working at a radio station. And so pretty much... So I've, what radio? Have you have done like Nova and stuff like that? Or like? Yeah, I've, I've worked for every radio station. As host or like more behind the scenes you grew into? No, all sorts of different things. Uh, many times on the radio, um, most times on the radio. As like a host, or as because you yeah. do more like reporting now, don't you? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's looked all sorts of different ways, and as and I suppose what what that means is I've I have done most jobs. The only thing I haven't done is worked in the sales department in a radio station, but I've I've been on the air on. Pretty much every community radio station in South Australia, except for Radio for the Print Handicapped, and I've always wanted to do that because I think that's a great challenge because they literally kind of read out of the newspaper, and to be able to read things without pre-reading them, and then you think of some of the names or the places or some of the pronunciations yeah, you got come like along. Whoa, whoa, whoof, yeah, that, that that'd be tough. I didn't even know that's a channel. Yeah, and then I've, all the commercial stations I've worked for, um, and yeah, I've, I've worked at. Nova and so what I've, kind of roles have you done? Rattle them off. Yeah, so I've been general manager. I've been uh, content director. I've been assistant content director. I've been breakfast producer. I've been reporter. I've been announcer. Been street team. Yeah, pr- yeah. promotions. You've done it all. That's a lot. Yeah, but again, it's it's very much like what I was saying before about you know, kind of when you're doing things that you like, you just. Sometimes being in the environment itself is enough as you're learning something. And the great gift has been being, as I got my first job when I was 17, uh, I cannot picture my 17-year-old self walking into a radio station and someone going, oh, we should definitely employ him. That's just crazy to me. It is crazy. With what I knew as a human being, (laughs) 
Oh, man. But, you know. What do you mean? Why? Well, I don't know. I I just I have no idea how I would have shown up. Obviously, good enough to get the job. Yeah, like you wouldn't hire a young 17-year-old? That like, Oh, no, I'm always looking for those types of people. To like kind of not, for lack of a better word, term, groom them into being like a really good professional. Yeah, I think that's the best case scenario and, and often is probably used, um, yeah, to get someone who hasn't been uh, impacted by how the industry operates. And, you know, and, and if you see something that could really fit with your brand, kind of getting them in early and really showing them your way of doing things, you can really develop talent from the ground up that way. I feel like that's a big thing that's changing these days. Mm. And like without – like music, for example, music industry doesn't really touch talented people anymore. They touch people with followings. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a, a real shame. It's a shame. Actually, I wanted to get your view on this as well. This is a bit more political, but obviously you're in media heavy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you think about fake news and this whole like huge, not in the Trump sense, but like in the sense of like people just having this huge distrust in media and that there's heaps of propaganda going on? Mm. It's interesting you raise that because it's really been these last couple of years for the first time that some people around me had started developing an opinion of what the media is and and often in conversation, particularly when it comes to um, vaccines or uh, any kind of mandates around you know, how we should be living our lives um, these couple of years, there have been intelligent people that have started developing the opinion that somehow in media we're all in it together. And what I've not been able to explain to these people and have them fully get because they just can't hear it anymore Certainly, if you're working for commercial radio, like we are all trying to outdo each other. There is no way that we are joining hands, skipping into the, the sunshine with the same agenda. Absolutely not. Yeah, there might be some things when in terms of, you know, if there's an industry award show or something, there's an acknowledgement for the type of work that people do over. I think there's, there's a respect for the, you know, for good work, wherever that may exist. Mm. But there is no way that... We're in this together. I have never been in a meeting uh, when it comes to news at any radio station where like a leader, a, a general manager, a CEO or anyone has ever stood in front of us and said, you know, all that news that's out there, well, we're only doing it this way. This is how we do it. And if, and if uh, you want to talk about stuff in this territory, well, we're not going to do that. I've never, ever been in a meeting like that. There, I've never been told how to cover news. Not at all. I, I mean, t- obviously, you can't swear, and there's like rules of like you know stuff like that. But the, the way it comes out, like structurally, so it might be like uh, instead of having a five minute um, news break, we're going to have a two minute news break instead. Mm-hmm. So some and some radio stations might do that because they don't see themselves as being a news station. Yeah, pretty much all of them have news, but some of them are like well. We can just give headlines and people have the internet. They can you know, find it out for themselves. Yeah. Um, and some people like to be more comprehensive with that. But, you know, also if you're making money, um, the more space you have to make money, then, you know, that's what you would do. And if you have no commitment to news, then there's no problem with that. Um, Fair. But, I mean, that's all, I'd, that's all I'd say about that. And also, you know, obviously, where you get your news sources from. I find now that – see, when you work in media, it's amazing how much is coming at you you don't have to look for. So you just you are just surrounded by news. It, it's a challenge for people during the pandemic at its hardest points. It would have been really tough for people in yeah, Melbourne and places like that. Don't you think because the media obviously gets to hang out with each other all the time that they're trying to catch scoops and whatnot off one another? Because like I've started working at Sky News as a cameraman, mm-hmm. which has been awesome, right? And you get to see behind the curtain of like it's a hard, like a really hard job. You're like at a situation trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Yeah. And then within like 30 minutes after that, you're like written this whole like description in context of the whole day. Mm. And you have to do that like five times a day and try to figure out what has changed. Yeah. Like it's not easy to do. No. But what I have seen is that like different, the all the news anchors and stuff, like they're leveraging off each other to try to figure out what is going on. So therefore the more dominant kind of like, uh, I guess characters doing their job are kind of writing the narrative in a sense and they're all kind of playing off that information they've been given from one another. It's the same in radio because obviously yeah. for field stuff, I'd assume it would be 
pretty similar. Yeah, you're uh, because I can probably largely speak from the ABC context now, and I'm trying to think of a specific example, one won't come to me right now. But I'll, but say if there is, if there's something that's big breaking news, it's one of those things where you're like, do we really know this is happening? Like what what more do we need What's to like know? That Vicky Chapman thing. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Like, that was pretty. Yeah. So we. So the ABC, though, there are very strong structures. So really, it's in the hands of the legal team at a certain point, and that and they will then give what you. What do you mean? So they. So if there's something that you want to report on, and you know it's kind of on the line, like it's not just like a a, car, a simple car accident or or something like that. If it's something that there is, there's more. It's a bit um, complex. Yeah, more parts, but particularly if. Uh, Getting an incorrect could result in defamation, you know those kind of things. Um, you would you'd go to the legal department, you'd have a conversation about what you've got, and you'd effectively you might plead your case about what you want to say, and then the legal team would tell you what you can and cannot say. So on some occasions, it might be that another news source uses the name or uses the image of someone mm. before the ABC. But the ABC is more interested in being correct and doing, you know, what's right and not impacting people adversely or the or their organisation adversely. Because the last thing you want to do is be dealing with defamation payouts, and that really is the case in every radio station. You know, that's that's probably the major training you get. Is, yeah, let's not defame someone. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's a big impact, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, but that's been going on a lot. By the looks of it, there has been a lot of like media hit. Mm-hmm. kind of like journeys. I mean, it looks yeah. more Americanized than it is like Australian. Yeah. But it definitely is happening in Australia. Like Yeah, I, I think more like, so. More so, definitely. Yeah. Like I feel like we are becoming more polarized in our media mm. kind of narrative. Like it, everything's becoming a lot more editorial yes. as opposed to just like here's what's going on. Like yes. why, do, why is that? Like is it as like a – combat it because the internet is more like that no i think like, it's money well that, it just makes more money because yep. it draw, causes more drama and people get more yep. into it and they watch it more and they talk about it more and stuff like that yeah when that's I, shame isn't it <laughs> i got employed at the abc i had one conversation it wasn't even an interview i just went to take a look mm. and then the um the who would then become my boss said so how do you see yourself working with us and I hadn't really considered it. I suppose I'd always wanted to, but I just sort of never thought I'd be a good fit for the organisation. And that? Well, I always had the view that you had to be super intelligent to work at the ABC. I thought, wow, like these people are really like are doing radio on a slightly different level. I sort of felt, oh, you know, I'm not that in, I'm not the intelligent guy. Yeah. Um, or I'm kind of not so desperately passionate about news that, you know, like I, th- I thought I had to be like a super news hound, like the kind of person whose life was just overtaken like, by the news. i the paper every morning. Yeah. And I'm looking at all this. I love it. But yeah, yeah no. Nah. Whereas I love, st- I love, you know, people's stories and, you know, I love being across what's actually happening in the world, but um, that's about it. Yes. Um, and he said to me, how do you see yourself working with us? And then there was a pause and I said, well, look, I just wouldn't be a stand for old people complaining about their lives. And that's all I said. And then there was a pause after that. And I was like, oh, my God, what did I just say? Because I didn't think about anything that I was saying. And then he rocked back in his chair and said, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. When would you like to start? You know, oh, and that was, that was it. But, I, but the reason I share that with you too <clears throat> is because that's why I um, get involved in anything. It's always to further it, no matter what role I have. Mm. So I've worked in talkback radio in the past without being where I am now as a human being you know, without arriving at this place where I really am committed to making a difference everywhere. I'd always wanted to have impact, but I'd never looked at the difference I could make to human beings. I'd always looked at the impact I could have to further the business or, you know, to get more ratings or that kind of thing. And so at other... A bit more insular. Yeah. In the focus. Well, effectively trying to impress the boss, I suppose, for one of a better description. Yeah. Um, And so what... You know, you would choose things to just make people talk. Now, that's okay if the conversation is productive, but a lot of the time, what that would look like is you choose a topic so people could ring in and complain about things. And that's, 
I mean, I've got to say, that is largely what talkback radio is. Yeah. It yeah. really is that. And if... I feel like that... <laughs> Like the ABC morning stuff is pretty like that. Like, like that, the youth show, it's like, yeah, let's talk about the big ones like, oh, housing prices and, you know, rent prices. And it's like, obviously, it's going to trigger all the, all the youth because, like, it, shit is expensive. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not saying that, uh, like, I'm not in charge of that framework. There, there, are, there are things that exist um, in all radio, and of course, you know, listeners are really important. So you you really want people's points of view, and um, it's just how you go about doing that. And you can't stop someone from complaining, other than you know, if you have multiple calls, and there's ten calls, and there's two people complaining. If you really are, hang on, this is just a complaint. It's not really taking the conversation anywhere. You cannot put those calls to air. Yeah, exactly. And you put the calls to air that are going to further something. Yeah. I'd while that might show up, while the complaining may show up in various areas because that is the nature of... Yeah, but that's not your show, is. so no, you don't really control that. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's, not, it's not what... Well, it's hard to be with. You know, I used to think it was cool to be with because I'm what, like, isn't it great? Complaints? Yeah, all these people ringing in, isn't it great? Look, we really have, you know, hit the nail on the head with this topic, isn't it great? No, rubbish. We hadn't. We Basically, what we were doing was agitating people to have a conversation go around in a circular motion without any result over and over again. And there are topics like that that you can... I feel like that's how the media's been heavy right now, though. Mm. It's like it doesn't have other points of view. It's a real challenge, particularly in the pandemic. I think it's been, and I, I feel don't. Like that is the best example, right? Yeah, because it was very one narrative focus. Like it was no like Robert Malone getting air on mm-hmm. national radio. No, like, it's um, it has been a real challenge, and I don't have any of the answers. And I still, I've, I've kind of come out of this experience none the wiser, really, because what you what you were dealing with was information has to be delivered here. Well, the feeling was that it had to be delivered. Yeah. Because people need to know it. This is information that people are asking us to know this. They want to know it. When we know it, we should tell them it. Because mm. that's, you know, that's what we do. That I suppose that is the news ultimately. Yes. Um, but what was happening was the communication that we were getting to broadcast would it would change over time. Yeah. Well, like I, I, the lab I, leak theory. At it, first that was like, no, 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 no. Now it's like the predominant theory. Yeah, but that was all it was all sort of according to how we were receiving it. And so where did you guys re- how did you receive? So it like it might be at a press conference, it might be a press release, it might be, you know, whatever is actually happening out there in the world through us interviewing people or whatever. But you would note that um you know, things that people said were a certain way <laughs> over time. Like politicians, yeah, or, li- largely, really, or the you know the the figureheads in in the state that were that were really in charge of what's been going on. You know, their story has certainly changed. The, yeah, their, their story has changed because also for them, they've been gathering information over time to determine whatever has been going on. So I don't I just felt like there was such a lag. Yeah, I don't like not just from media, but from talking heads of like yeah. politicians and stuff. It's like. Why was I able to find out six months before what was going, you know? Mm. And it was like from things that were like, oh, that's actually some solid evidence. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, that's a wild conspiracy theory, even though that was, a, you know, especially with social media, like actually like fully like cutting people off. Mm. Um, being like, oh, that's actually a reasonable counter argument to it. But then it just never got to anything mainstream for like yeah. a year. I think and it was it- like, that it's sentiment not like it wasn't there. No, that sentiment definitely came through, and it was you know, when you're caught up in a news cycle in a certain way, like getting information from certain places, and there being that sort of undercurrent of people looking in different places too. You, you know, you had you had the combination of you know the narrative changing over time from the people you were consistently speaking to and then you'd have other things emerge as people started looking in different places for themselves and then the argument was well are the places you are looking in are they kind of credible yeah, but I think my, my experience was and maybe some of those things were and maybe they really weren't and I, I don't know but my experience was really probably like everyone else's you know whether you worked in the media or not just at times being really confused. Yeah. Oh, dude, especially in the first like six months. Mm. Like that was frightening. 
That was a very yeah. funny time. Like from because I I saw this in I think it was January twenty third. I was with my friend. I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna, this is this is gonna be big. Mm. So then I was like, from January third to that I was freaking out. I was like, oh, this is gonna be big. And then when America like closed closed, it was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Now you know, yeah, this is it. This is this is this is the thing. And then I, you know, based on like, oh, here's the death rates at the time. They thought it was gonna be like four percent. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god, there's gonna be more people dead than like World War Two. Like it's gonna yeah. be terrible. I want to um, share something with you. And this is so. This is how it was before it really hit here. And I can only speak from personal experience because I actually this was content that I did before things got um, stopped here in whenever it was March a couple of years ago yeah I did a because sometimes you know when I'm out and about with people uh, sometimes it's really uh, heavy serious stuff you know you can be at the scene of um, someone who's died or um, sometimes it can be really fun and it can be bizarre and you know and ridiculous it just sort of depends on what's going on and that's that's what I love about doing it I I never know what I'm going to do day to day Mm. but when coronavirus uh, emerged in China, I went out and I did Vox Pops with people with beards because we'd read a article that if you had a beard, you were more susceptible to coronavirus because at that time, you know, we'd been told the droplets would Land catch in people's beard. beards. And so I went around talking to people with beards about like, do you know that you're in, you know, if you get this, you're in real trouble. And it was a, it was a comedic thing. Yeah. But at that time when I was doing that, that was – what we were talking about was a news story that was far away from us that we probably never expected to really have that kind of impact here. We were seeing people in hazmat suits spraying down streets, you know, taking people from their homes, putting them in the back of paddy wagons. And there I was down at uh, some shopping complex talking to people with beards, That's like telling the them, Australian thing, isn't you it? better shave like, that off. I know. <laughs> over there in Europe, they're freaking out. In China, they're freaking out. Hey, mate, you guess what? You might die because you got a beard. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, <laughs> like, but that's how, you know, naive, naive we... <laughs> Well, we had no yeah, sense of it. it's true. Mm. Yeah, and that was a scary time. Mm. But I do think it was a huge lag, and it did seem like there was a huge, like you know, even though you were saying there's no like actual orchestration that you've experienced, it yeah. did seem pretty orchestrated because like the whole yes. world had the exact same narrative, pretty much in terms of mainstream media. Like, I think that probably was because of where we're getting our information from or where we're getting our cues from. Like just and the official sources were like, yeah, just so, yeah. So you'd have corrupt. to <laughs> like. No, well, I don't, I don't know that I'd say that. I think they were just dealing with whatever they were dealing with and then we were waiting for them to say whatever they needed to say and then we would report on that. All right, I've got a question. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> that's what we're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank heavens for that. <laughs> um, so, do you know Nikolai Petrovsky? No, but I'm aware, I'm aware, aware of, of what him. he's done and we've had him on the radio. Yep. Yeah, what's going on there, man? He's getting grilled by like the TGA and stuff. It mm. literally looks like they're trying to stop him. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely his experience. Like, what's going on? What What do you think's going on? I I like, just don't know. I just don't know. I don't have the answers. And uh, like I said before, with some of these things, I'm left confused. And I can only assume that you know, there's obviously some red tape, or there's, um, or again, that you know, there's money. But I feel like the money thing is big. I feel like, yeah. like my experience was like I could always fathom and grasp and see what like international corruption look like because like mm. in america there's been huge you know yeah. operation paperclip like there's mm. just been huge examples of oh wow these are very corrupt things like when they were giving people well, like syphilis or something like that mm-hmm. and experimenting on like african-american populations like oh my god that was like that's terrible mm. um and that was clear corruption whereas in australia it was like what's our version of modern day corruption like what does it actually look like yeah, I think that um, obviously big business, you know, I, I don't know what that world's like because I've never been in it, but mm. you would imagine it would be extremely cutthroats. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, us, the people that are playing that game, goodness knows, you know, whatever space they're in. What I do know is even uh, locally, and I only heard this uh, recently and I'm not going to give all the detail, but I, I do know of... Um, someone who took their own life uh, and that appears to be because they were so geared towards looking a certain way in the community 
when they made a business decision that did, wasn't the continuation of that. It actually started really going south. They didn't know how to deal with that and decided it was a better choice to take their own life from than to like, deal with it because of how they would look in the community. From like they didn't – like a, a work thing or like a no, – like they didn't no. operate in a way that was like they were going to get a mob after them or no, like – No, just simply go from a highly successful business to a business that was really going to fail. Oh, okay. So they made like a financial terrible decision. That's that right. The, the business was going to – Yeah. Failing. So the reason I say that is, you know, if that is a snapshot of what drives some people to do business – which might be, you know, I want to always be top of the tree. Mm. You know, it could be a bit of an ego thing. And then, of course, you'd have people who are just, you know, really connected to the people that work with them and then the responsibility that comes with that. You know, there's somebody... Oh, that's huge. Organi- oh, yeah, I can't even huge. imagine what that's like. Having managed a, a radio station of, you know, sort of 16 employees and 250 volunteers, I knew the pressures associated with that. I can't imagine what that would look like thousands of times over. Yeah. So, you know... That is a rarefied space that most of us don't really get to experience. But certainly if your livelihood was being was about to be impacted and you had the um, the resources available to you, you'd probably take steps to try and, you know, keep your business thriving. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's like you can't even knock a lot of it. No. You can understand it if you're in the shoes of it, but there are definitely some like – moving elements like have you heard about like i mean uh, who who the figurehead of it now is you know because they always got to find like who's the bad guy associated with it which Mm -hmm. is obviously on any side of politics is like the way to do it because it just makes it more digestible Mm -hmm. um is like the world economic forum with their idea the famous quote from cloud swabs saying like you will own nothing and be happy Mm -hmm. have you heard that no i haven't i did it's eerie and like they have goals of um, essentially creating it so there's all the residential property is like bought up by huge businesses and everybody's renting and like we won't have like our own cars and like mm-hmm. uh, and then also the guy that who is it the, yeah I mean governments around the world even the the Reserve Bank of Australia started looking into digital currencies um, the UK started looking at digital currencies the, the head treasurer there. He's come out saying, hey, we want them to be programmable. So if you're not doing something that the government wants you to do, then you, we could freeze your assets in Canada with the truckers convoy thing. They actually froze people's assets, redirected all this uh, um, crowd-funded money, like crazy stuff, mm. which is like pretty scary. Um, but where was I going with that? <laughs> um, I don't know. I can't remember where I was going with that. But it's just wild stuff. Yeah, I, I think, think it's, it's, I don't know, on a personal level i'm always i always think the best of people and i always like to think that humans are driven to do the right thing and clearly that's not the case for some well i think people. it is both i think it's like star wars mm. you know you, you i think it is you got the jedis and then you got the sith and all that like yeah there really is some there is evil people i could definitely the thing is uh, you know i have so much time and for me, it's not a value or worth my time looking in to that focus space. on that. Yeah, that's and fair. But I'm interested in it. I just want someone – it'll be great for someone to do some expose into that because it's definitely, you know, it's like a behind-the-scenes look at how the world works. I think, you know, for most of us, it's, it's kind of out of plain sight and it's unclear. And then when, you know, when we get something, it's very easy, and particularly in this unstable environment that we're in, even more so – it sort of creates this environment to then start, you know, go hunting for yourself. But I, I don't know that we'd ever get a, a real clear picture of what's actually happening unless we were there. That's fair. And, I mean, that's what it would be cool if we saw politicians doing this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? Like, yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, it really would. It was very interesting even, uh, uh, you know, the other day when you were seeing – you know, politicians on the campaign trail and then seemingly quite stopped by everyday people with reasonable questions or, you know, relaying experiences that have really impacted them and then seeing how how difficult it is for you know, the powers that be to be with that. Yeah. You know, it's much it's much easier to kind of you know group 
uh, people in and sort of see things in black and white and numbers and, and that kind of thing. But when you really – to see uh, leadership not being able to engage with everyday people in a way that they can have like a meaningful conversation or ac- actually yeah, make like a difference in that conversation. present with someone. Yeah, I, I mean, I get it because there's obviously – you know, if you're on the campaign trail, you have a schedule, there's things to do. And if that conversation arrives at a certain time – you know, perhaps you're thinking more about the thing that you're about to do and getting there than actually being with the person. But it's not a a great look. And I think we've seen great leadership show up elsewhere. You know, you just take yeah, a look at how, yeah. how how New Zealand just, you know, just into Ardern, how she just went from not being known to all of a sudden just being seen as this incredibly um, compassionate leader. She had a certain way about her that had her seem like she was with the people rather than... She was in an office. She's and the always people been were out a there. great speaker. Yeah, I feel like that has been her strength. I don't necessarily love a lot of what she's done, but sure, I yeah. do think she is a great speaker, and she definitely connects in a similar way to like your Barack Obama. I was, I was going to say, yeah, I think that it's a very similar trait there, where there it does seem to be a genuine uh, compassion or, or mm. genuine interest in human beings uh, excelling in some way, or the, everyone you know having a fair go at, at things. Um, and then you see, um, you know, the, the Ukrainian example. It's just unbelievable how Zelensky, you know, his leadership in this yeah, time. He's like, is come phenomenal. back. He's like, I'm on the front line with you, which, yeah, you don't see. Yeah. What it's, is it about those people, too? I've been really taken by the Ukrainians, how, you know, people in prominent positions in life have said, I'm going to stop doing that and I'm putting on the army fatigues and I'm getting in there with you. I mean, I cannot imagine that happening here. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, I would be, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> you know, yeah, it'd be wild. It's definitely. I mean, I guess also depends who you're coming up against, but, um, yeah, it is. There's a lot of bravery in that, and I feel like that is something that we will be getting represents with over the next fifty years in mm. the world because I do think we're kind of we're gearing up for that kind of stuff to happen again. It's unfortunate, but we kind of are. There's a lot of polarity. There's a lot of internal combustion going on around the world mm. especially in like the west mm. we're internally combusting our ideas of which we all are grounded in are kind of being challenged against one another all the ideas we were like oh yeah this is why we would fight for our own countries mm. there's there's growing minorities that are starting to challenge those fundamental ideas of why we are nations with yeah. our set of beliefs which is pretty it's pretty shocking i think um with all of those things, there's generally someone wanting to be right or making someone else wrong. Oh, for sure. And if you could simply remove that, I mean, really that's what I'm most interested in is those types of conversations that take that out of the conversation because I think if you take that out of most conversations, they would go a very different way. Yeah, well, people get to see that the intent of one another. Yeah, you'd actually then, communicate. Yeah. You'd actually... You know, it wouldn't have to be about ag- agreeing. It's you know, people will have whatever point of view they have, but it there would be more compassion. You know, people would at least be heard, mm. and I think that's what you know, stops so, you know, will create so much, uh, and and stops people kind of living, um, or having that sense of freedom, because I don't know that freedom. Even freedom looks a certain way. But certainly the experience of always being seen and heard would for most people be largely enough, I would think. And I, I, I also I think that yeah, it would be, that I is mean, even rare. I think now. there are some – yeah, I agree with that in terms of like an as-lived experience of like – of uh, you know, being, being seen and heard, as you said. Mm. But I do think there is there are some things that we know that there is, you know – a scale of like, hey, you have more financial sovereignty, you have less mm. financial sovereignty, sure. you have more freedom of movement, you have less freedom of yes. movement. Like, I think there are some measurable yeah. things of like, hey, that we consider those things free. Well, that is that's a that's a very interesting conversation in itself because you know, when you, you know, I think that's the thing people have different views of what being free actually is, don't they? Oh uh, yeah, well, the, oh, because there's absolute freedom in in anarchy, right? And then we're like, we've kind of agreed, hey, it doesn't work to have absolute anarchy mm. because. Uh, and it doesn't work to splinter off into all these small colonies because, well, we're just going to get taken over. So we do need a big defense force because we know there are the com- you know, companies, 
And he kind of is like that. <laughs> there are the countries that are like, hey, we don't really care for your system and we'll just eat you. Yes. Uh, so yeah. there are some things that we do need and obviously to be able to have freedom. Yes. But I, f- I don't know. I feel like there's linguistic warfare. There's linguistic warfare of just like even the word freedom. I feel like that's been like, you say that in a workplace, like, yeah, I'm for freedom. They'll be like, oh, you're one of those. And it's like, yeah. what do you mean? Like, yeah. It's like everybody's just attaching like, oh, this must mean you have these shopping lists of ideas yes. instead of going like, oh, cool, same. Mm. What's your version? Yes, oh, ex- exactly. Wouldn't it be great if, uh, if people could just say what they saw freedom as and were supported in achieving that? Yeah. Well, however that looks. Because I just want people to be able to go after their utopias. You know, like mm. you're like without obviously, you know, like mm-hmm. hurting others and infringing on their life in a in a negative way. Mm. And obviously, there's lines of that as well. You know, like hey, I want to chop down my tree in my land, mm-hmm. and they don't want you to chop down your tree. Yes. stuff like that. You know, yeah, drama. But um, that's what makes it great, though, isn't it? That we're all human. Like, it is. It's great. It's there's always something happening. There's always another conversation to have. There's always something new to break through. There's yeah, there's an opportunity to see something from a different point of view. And you did a collection of conversations in podcast format, didn't mm-hmm. you? And you went out to all these different kind of – was it underprivileged communities that you were talking to? No, I've, I've done all sorts of um, stuff. Probably my favourite work, and it wasn't a podcast, but just doing the work of reporting has definitely been with um, Indigenous communities. I've, I've said to elders that I've only just started beginning to understand what they're dealing with now. I can't believe that – I, because I think I'm a, you know, a, a reasonable person, like someone who is, you know, really wants everyone to do well in life and be free and yeah. don't want ever, anyone held back. I thought because there was progress in those areas that... Um, in terms of closing, like, the gap? Yeah, and you can really see that, particularly as new generations come up and just some of the things that are implemented in, um, you know, in education and, you know, what kids are taught now versus what I was taught at school, two very different things. So, you know, I only had to work with whatever I had available. So you can see it improving, but then you start saying, oh, just because it's improving doesn't make it good. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a lot more to go. I feel like I had John Cardi on, mm-hmm. Head of Humanities, and yep. he he enlightened me and just like how important it is going to be having this art and culture centre mm. at Lot 14 mm-hmm. and what that is actually going to mean for like us as a healing as a healing agent for the relationship with the indigenous as like, you know, yeah, Australians, you know, as a multicultural, not just white people, but like all the different people that have come over that haven't actually get, been able to connect with the, you know, the oldest living uh, group of people that we know of. Yeah. That's like still. Oh, they are thing. extraordinary and they're consistently what dismissed. What kind of things did you learn? Um, like, what, the, the what, most, well, who'd you talk to first? Well, the most impactful radio that I've ever done was when I was speaking to Uncle Jeffrey Newchurch, Ghana Elder, and I was speaking to him at the city of Holdfast in a park that was uh, looked out onto the beach, and I was there with him and his people had been, other Ghana people had been camping overnight because they had finally got together all these Aboriginal remains of their old people from museums all over the world to finally lay to rest where they should rightfully be. And um, Geoffrey Newchurch had had really spearheaded all of that happening. And is he an Indigenous elder? Yes. Yeah, he is. And um, so this is – I'm the first person – a first non-Aboriginal person on the scene. But we know that the event is going to happen. It's happening at a certain time and there are boxes of bones and there's going to be a ceremony and then those boxes are going to be taken away and in a, uh, there's going to be a private burial, but there's going to be the you know the council and politicians and things there. So I knew that that was going to happen and, and that's largely how it was going to go. But I sat there um, on the other side of a picnic table to Jeffrey. He'd just come out of his tent and I was there just by handheld equipment and we sat on the side of that um, that bench and you know I just asked questions and just listened what did you ask him? 
Well, the most impactful thing that I asked, I was just asking, you know, how did this come to be? Um, what did it take? All of those kind of things. Just, just trying to understand. And this is the first time I'd really had to deal uh, with an Aboriginal person in that way. The ABC has very strong policies and procedures around dealing with Aboriginal people. And when I realised I had to do that the following morning, I was like, I know nothing about it what's right, what's right, I don't want to offend anyone. I just really had concern about it. I don't want to put anything in the space. So I quickly read the, the policies and they were there was a lot of them. So I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to absorb all of this. What can I largely take from this? And so you could sort of uh, get when, you know, uh, when to refer to Aboriginal people, when to, uh, when to use the word Indigenous, you know, when to, uh, you know, refer to, People's Ghana people, all any you know, about referring to pe- people that. who've just said, yeah. Well, I mean, nor did I, and, yeah. and I had to read this document, and I can't tell you everything that's on it. But then, but basically, I kind of got the sense of, okay, don't worry about offending these people. Just listen, really. And so I'm there with Jeffrey, and just asking him about that. And as we're having this conversation, I'm like this must have been a monumental effort. Like, how's how's this guy pulled this together? Yeah, it's a pretty and, big thing. And what would it be like? This. What would I be like? If my family's bodies were in museums all over the world. And it wasn't like their grandparents, great, great, great grandparents. Like how how old were these? Some bodies? of these things, you know, dated back quite some time. You know, it wasn't sort of in recent history, but you know, quite some time. And um so I'm, you know, I'm having this conversation, I'm putting myself in his position too, going, What would that be like for me? I'd be like, I'd be really angry. And, you know, he wasn't angry with me as we were having this conversation. He was just talking about it and it was he has this very slow, deliberate way of talking. And he's – I've always – well, this is the first time, but I've just always felt this connection with Jeffrey because of the space that he holds. I don't know how else to put it into words. I, like he just has a powerful presence? And you kind yeah, of but not charismatic. To to him. Not charismatic, just holding – it's like a wisdom is probably the best way I could say it. And anyway, as as he continued talking about this, what happened was, so I'm reporting live. There's the people on air, Ali and David, are in the studio. They've thrown to me. I'm having this conversation. And it's just me driving the conversation, but I was fully expecting them to participate in the conversation at some point. But then what happened was two tears dropped from Jeffrey's eyes simultaneously. It was like it was choreographed. It wasn't one tear quicker than the other. They both left his eye at the same time and travelled down his cheek at the same speed, drawing two lines from his eyes to his beard. And I had this moment where I saw that. I knew that I was the only one that had seen that and I needed to say something about that because I could tell there was something about what he was saying that I didn't fully understand, or, except for putting myself in his position, but I can, he's now being really impacted by this. I was like, I've got to say something. So I, I just, like, I, I'll just say what I can see and that's it. And I said, Jeffrey, two tears just ran from your eyes. I'm, and I said something to the extent of, this must have taken everything. What's this been like for you personally? And then he just broke down into tears. And I really got that everything it had taken for him to create that moment, to put to rest these old people, to put a full stop on a chapter of Aboriginal history, to for the step that it was forward in terms of, you know, true reconciliation and I got that no one had asked him what it was like for him. Because here I was sitting over there thinking, what would it be like for me if all my family were in museums? And I'm like kind of internally, I'd be raging right now. And here's this guy that's sort of had to have all these conversations, taken all this effort, that he is whatever age he is and he's probably wanted this for a long time or and at times never thought it possible. I was just like... Wow, this is really interesting though. Even his own people see him as the guy that gets things done. And perhaps no one's ever really asked if he's okay. It was a very powerful moment. Mm. And 
Yeah, you saw him being like properly vulnerable. Yeah. And it, when I asked that question, there was this long pause and all you could hear was like a couple of birds that I'd not heard up until that point in the tree and just a very slight crashing of waves in the distance and the breath of the two announcers into their microphones in the studio. And I had that one moment where I was like, oh, have I said the wrong thing? <laughs> like, what, what have I said? It was like the world stopped. Yeah, you were freaking out. You're like, oh, did I do the thing that I didn't? I tried not to do. Yeah, but I knew I didn't. And then yeah. he, and then he just it's like sounds like like TV, like magic moment. Yeah, he just spoke so beautifully. Like he really got to talk about everything it had taken and how proud it was. And anyway, then uh, then what happened was they did the ceremony. All that kind of thing happened hours later. People drove from other media and said, "Were you the guy that had that conversation?" I'm like. Yeah, they're like, oh, my God, we were all crying. And I kind of knew that I'd done a special thing, but it was just so interesting that it really was just that one question. It yeah. wasn't anything else. But then they went and buried the old people and it was a very moving um, ceremony. But then the person from the radio station, the social media person said, can you get a picture of Jeffrey for an article? And I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's just gone through this thing. He's just gone and literally buried these people. He's in the bushes somewhere. I don't know where he's going to come out. I'm like, oh, how am I going to ask him for a photo? So I, I just stood somewhere and went, I'll just keep just an eye open. Loitering around and be like, I need this goddamn photo of a social media. <laughs> but it was so poetic because like exactly where I was standing, Jeffrey emerges from the bushes and like literally walks towards only me when I'm surrounded by people. And we just embraced and we were both crying and I said, do you mind if I take a picture for social media? He said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> just to end yeah. it. Just yeah. to, hey, mind if I get that photo of that? <laughs> Can I get your autograph as well? And what did he say? Like, What was his message to you? He's, um, Jeffrey and I have become friends. And when I say that, it's not that, you know, it's not like we hang out or anything. But um, like acquaintances. You like yeah. see each other around and have time for each other. Yeah. We, it, I'd say we know each other. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'd say. He knows very appreciation for one another. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't know any detail about my life. I really don't know too much detail about his life, but I think we just get what each other is committed to, yeah. and you know that's really that's really special. So sometimes you know when he's when there's something that he'd like um, to be heard, he'll he'll come to me, and then I'll do whatever I can to see if there's you know there's an opportunity to. Yeah, is that a value and is it worth it? I can't remember a time when he's come to me when it hasn't been a value. Yeah. So it's been really awesome. That is actually another interesting thing because obviously part of your job is creating those kind of connections, not necessarily on that mm. same kind of level, but mm. creating connections with people so then they do come to you with scoops or like things that are important to share. And yep. what has it been like to – for? because I think people – network with people around the world and they don't know how to sustain relationships mm -hmm. you're clearly in the business of doing that mm -hmm. what is what is your process and what is that like for you um well i don't deliberately do it i think i just i'm just really interested in people who seem to want to further things and who get that complaining about it isn't going to further it so the people who I really want to actively engage in conversations to change things. So they're the people that I'm most interested in. And I would say the relationships that I have are probably not the way you think they might look. So I wouldn't say that I have this little black book with all these people that I can go to and they come to me for things. No, it's it's really phone. not like that. It's, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not even in the phone. It, re it seriously yeah. isn't. What... Um, what I've become very good at is meeting a stranger and building very quick relatedness with them. Not as, not as a strategy, but because it works. Yeah. So if I give up everything else and go, okay, I know I'm here for this reason, but let's just forget about that for the moment. Let's just be with this person. You can, you can create a space where, you know, people are a bit more expressed or they're not worrying about saying, what they think they should say, they actually just get to say what's there for them. And so I'm very proud of the space that I can create with people, which I've developed over time and didn't know I can do. And it really is only on, in reflection um, that I 
that I get that I can do it. But I also, it's, it is something that is only available to you, again, if you're looking at the other human being mm. rather than what they need to communicate. It's that, that's the thing that makes the difference. You know, there's, you know with, through this conversation there has been that narrative about, you know, what is it about uh, being human that makes things different or has us all be the same? But that's that's the thing, right? That that's the only thing we all are <laughs> together. Yet we rarely are with each other in that way. Mm. Sadhguru said this interesting thing. Mm. He was like, "We are in this universe, and we are like the only species we know of that has the blessing um, that often gets misused because we get too distracted with it. But what it is is we get to have our own universe inside our head." Mm. whilst we are in this universe mm. Mm. and that is so true and yeah. the people that are dictators and stuff it's like they're too caught in the universe of their head yeah i always have to remind myself when i'm having a really tough time of it and i start to become aware the reason it's so tough is because of what i'm saying to myself mm. then i always picture it's literally i picture myself at distance to myself like someone who's a suburb away, someone who's interstate, someone who's on the moon, someone who's in another country, wherever they might be. <laughs> and I just stop and go, does that person care about what's happening there for you? <laughs> hey, or are they no. interested? Is it impacting their lives? Are they making you wrong true. for whatever you're making you wrong? So you're true, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. They don't care. <laughs> we, we are so... I think that's fundamentally the problem with human beings. Not that there is one Be problem. Be convinced that it does. You know, yeah. Right. We actually... We foolishly think we're incredibly important. Oh, yeah, dude. So heavy. We're so just heavy. not. Like, we no. are just another I mean, look, species. There are planet. people that are more important in our world of things, but when you go out into the, the, the universe... Dude, we could be <laughs> dead in a second. There could be a solar flare and all this shit's fucking nothing. Or an asteroid. Yeah. It's just no, done. No, that's right. Like the dinosaurs were gone. Mm. You know, like mm-hmm. that could happen. So true. It's it's quite interesting. So yeah. then all these conversations and borders and all these kind of mm. you know, where they're just they're meaningless. But obviously inside of the context of what it means to be human right now, they are an important thing to mm. To address, I guess. Isn't it even funny when someone you care about, they you know they really they really want something, and for some reason they can't quite access it, or there's some frustration, or they're really upset about not having achieved the thing that they want to achieve. And really, when you love that person, all you want is for them to be happy, and you actually don't care. Like even though it'd be great for them to achieve whatever they achieve, I don't know that I even care about that. I just care about them being happy and getting that whatever they thought they needed to do there to fulfill themselves or impress themselves or impress others or whatever they actually never really needed to do that in the first place yeah i'm not quite there <laughs> oh look i think that's the whole i'm not quite there the whole i understand life. that yeah. i understand that and i have times where i'm like yeah man like we could just like mm. live on a beach and be hunter gatherers again and mm-hmm. i'm like what the hell is the point yeah I, what's I the get point that. of that it wouldn't be very stimulating given yeah. all the stimulus we have now well i think we like i i think Most it's people will be pretty content with themselves like you know they don't know anything else you know what they've only been exposed to um you know and we have so many laws at the moment oh dude so many and, laws and so many laws, so worse, many so rules oh it's forward. definitely yeah, getting worse so. but like it's like i think there is a real value in creating something extraordinary to share yes and yes. as and then have you heard of that uh the robert mishikaku mm-hmm. has uh Talked about it. I don't think he's the inventor of this train of thought, but it was like we're in stage zero Mm -hmm. civilization, the stage one, two, and three. And Mm -hmm. three is like when you get to like harness other universes for energy and stuff like that. Okay. So it's like crazy, like God level, like Mm -hmm. ability Mm -hmm. Um, and being able to like, you know, travel across time and space and Mm -hmm. fold, fold the universe and travel through it. Like, wow. Your jets and stuff. Yeah. Okay. But beyond. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're in stage zero. Mm -hmm. And to go to stage one is be able to like, you know, start like harnessing the energy of our, our solar system, mm-hmm. all of it. You know, so an example would be going out and mining asteroids, like having complete like renewable energy but in a circular way because currently mm-hmm. it's not a full circle. There's a lot of waste. Yep. So 
in a way that's just perpetual motion, like what Nikola Tesla was talking about in terms of like free energy and stuff. Like, have mm-hmm. you looked into that kind of stuff? No, only very surface level. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting because uh, that's it's a wild thought, right? Mm. But obviously, it would crush the kind of power systems and the establishment of the world because mm. a lot of the game of power is based on who has the most energy and bombs and stuff, mm-hmm. which is absurd. I can't hear. You um, can make the most money. Yeah, but I mean, it's not even money. It's beyond money. It's beyond money when you get to that like, level. Because Elon Musk said something in a podcast about like you only need I don't know, 150 square meters of solar panels to power the entire entire United States. So you know, and the only reason that they haven't done that is because you know they make so much money from it. It's not 150 square meters. Well, it's something. Yeah. It's something. <laughs> Be like, like 150,000. Yeah. But yeah. Something, I mean, solar roads and stuff like that. But yeah, I do think there is a value in creating things that like last millennia and generations Mm. and stuff like that. You know, like the idea of the Bible, whether you like the Bible or not, is pretty cool. The idea Mm. of like indigenous uh, songs, Mm. and they haven't been captured in a way that is translated to our modern culture yet. But Mm. the idea of these songs that create, you know, and a book for the Bible and the mm. Quran and those kind of things, are these like guiding forces that have lasted for thousands of years. And in the indigenous example, like 80,000 years mm. to be the tool set of here's how to survive. Mm. Here's yeah. how to go about life. Here's who to marry. Here's where, mm-hmm. where the water. Here's how you, you do life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's cool. It's it, really cool. It's very interesting. I think I'm really... You know, I am clear that I'm human. So I know that there will be things uh, that innately I'm dealing with because that's what I am. I'm, yeah. I'm a human. So, eat. yeah, exactly. And then instead of trying to stop those things, actually kind of give myself to it and go, okay, great. Well, I'm, I'm a human. I will talk to myself about stuff. I will have opinions about things and all that stuff, which is largely unproductive most of the time. Yes. Um, you know, if you take a look at all how productive I am, I, I mean, geez, if it was 1%, you'd be lucky, really. There'd, there'd be a lot of other stuff going on that really is, you know, not doing anything to further anything at all. But all I'm wanting to do, and I think this is really what I'm most committed to, is sort of being... the best possible person I can be when I die. And I don't really know how to put that into words other than I would like to think that, you know, some of the things that I wrestle with now, I wouldn't be wrestling with at that time. You know, there'd be a, there'd be a newfound kind of connectedness with everyone, like an, even a greater ease mm. in being with people at that time. There would be, I would like to think that, also I don't want to leave it until then. But I suppose the way that I see it is that the graph. I want the graph to keep going up, in terms of who I am as a human. Yeah, you want like a mind, body, and soul progression as you get older. So it's like you're. I think it's like you just become wiser. I guess the older you become, the more knowledge you consume. Yeah. I suppose. Um, yeah, and but the there's people who get like wise yeah. and bitter. Yeah, true. You know what I mean? It's like mm. they don't have that soul wisdom. Yeah. And I think that yeah. that's where you're touching on that completedness of like being at one with. Yourself. Life. Yeah, sort of having given yourself away fully. At that. So at the time, you know, I know that I won't get to choose when that happens, but if I continue on this path, it's like even if it happened tomorrow, I would like to think that whatever happened tomorrow would somehow further that game that I'm up to, yeah. even if it was just that brief interaction with someone or something like that. For well, sure. You know, it's a pretty powerful way to think, though. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think – but I, I mean – I just wonder what would that be like if you know everyone was seeking to do something similar. This is why we need things like personal need development. More people like you. And what we <laughs> what we met at, you know. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't think we didn't meet a landmark, do we? I think we no. met before, we met before that through like Biella and stuff like that. Yeah, we yeah we would have, I, yeah. I reckon. But there is something about um, you know that, that's the, the people that's I'm drawn tough. to. Yeah, the people that are really. It's not about seeking knowledge. So I think a lot of people that do personal development are looking for answers. Mm. And that's I'm not into that. I'm into... Progression. Pe- yeah, things. people who are really willing to um, explore and discover and grow. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, you begin to realise that a lot of our own growth has to do with our own commitments to, to grow rather than sort of, 
and that's he's not reading books. You know, I th- all those things are good. Yeah, it's all those taking action good. inside of that. Yeah. Those commitments. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's can be grueling. Sometimes it can be like really streamlined. You're like, yeah, yeah. I just killed that. That was great. But it's, it's isn't like it great flow. when you sort of break through something? Like I just very quickly went doing the roving reporting. I realized. You know, inside of having to get quick results because you're always working yeah. to the clock and there are certain deliverables. That if I was somewhere and I'm just with strangers and I've got to I've got to get content from them. Firstly, approaching it like that's never good. Because if you are I gotta get something from this person, that's that is so transactional and you're probably not gonna get what's really gonna make a difference anyway. You'll get something, you'll it'll be broadcast, but it's never you want but, something genuine. Yeah, exactly. Like you've got to give people the time. You've got to be with people to, and have a conversation. The, the content emerges from that rather than going to get the content. But I realised I was avoiding people. So I would avoid some people. So if some, so if you did, job hard. You know, you know, if you just looked um, kind of angry, uh, like if your face was kind of screwed up in a certain way or say if you had a tattoo on your face and then I realised there were some um, people from certain you know cultural minorities that I was – avoiding and the reason i was avoiding them was i was just making the assumption i don't think it's going to be as easy to understand that person as it will be to this person Mm -hmm. and then when i saw that i'm like oh this doesn't work because my commitment here is to give every single human a voice Mm -hmm. so if i i can't deliver on that if i'm avoiding people so then what i did was i'd arrive somewhere and i just talk to the people in front of me and just go to the the, you know that person and that person and the most extraordinary stuff would show up the person that you thought thought was angriest would be the most beautiful compassionate vulnerable person yes dude i feel that so heavy when i went Mm. studied abroad in 2016 in new york i literally set myself a bunch of games Mm. like just little side quest things Mm -hmm. like one for example didn't get a sim card was running off wi-fi for the whole six months wow it was cool yeah and i had a, a goal it was like and i learned this in vietnam or something it was like you ask three people for direction Two out of three of them say a certain way, that's probably right, right? Yes, yep. So, and if three out of three, you're like, sweet, I'm going the right way, 100%. Yep. But I would add on top of that game of going, I'm in America, right? I'm in New York, the melting pot of cultures around the world. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start challenging what I think it is to talk to um, not only masculine men, but those kind of masculinity that I'm afraid of. Yes. So yes. I started going to like, the scariest people in my perception at that 20 year old time yeah. and going asking for them for directions. Awesome. And it just broke down that barrier because they were just so like, they were just so forthcoming. You know, it was like, hey, yeah, yeah, da, da, da. And then yeah. like, what are you here for? And I remember this one guy I went up to, I wasn't necessarily crazy scared of him, but he was like a really big guy. Mm. He's a big guy, not fat, but just really tall, yep. masculine. And I went up to him and he sounded like Tyler the Creator. Like, <laughs> Wow. Exactly the same. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, your voice is so cool. But also, I asked him for direction. He's like, I don't know, man. I'm also new here myself. I can't do it. My voice yeah, can't yeah. go low. But you know, man. Good try. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and then after having a bit of chat, he was there from LA and we spent the whole day together. And we were both tourists yeah. in the city. And we went like Central Park. We got on the bikes here. went to an art gallery. We went and got food. Like all these things. That's awesome. Just from setting myself this little micro quest yeah. of like, I'm going to talk to people that I wouldn't usually talk to. And isn't it staggering? You're still telling that story now. It's had such an impact on your life. Oh, it was so cool. Because yeah. I literally flew across America later mm. that trip. Yeah. Went to LA and went and hung out with him in downtown LA. Yeah. Do you still have contact with him now? I do. Yeah. Yeah, he's, wow. a, he's a cool guy. He's, he's a pattern maker. He was really cool. Wow. Yeah, like pattern maker for clothes. Yeah, cool. But he was really interested in the innovation side of pattern making. Like, what does it look like to make like the next generation of like spacesuits? Like, what fabrics would you need to work with? What kind of things yeah, are possible? Like, he was really into that idea. I don't know how far he's actually gone down mm. that road of actually being involved with innovative suits and stuff like that but so cool yeah he opened me up to that whole idea of like there's all these fabrics that just have crazy use case you know like you yeah. could get a suit that is like like a raincoat did you know that and it doesn't look like a raincoat it's like weaved into it and it's like water repellent oh wow you can have a suit that's water repellent see that kind of technology i'm into right yeah yeah like every cool. like and because i because i obviously took it i was like yeah look i'm not gonna go around wearing an astronaut suit yeah but i took that idea and i was like 
what does that look like? And, and I was like, at this trade conference, I actually got to see these suits and stuff. I was yeah. like, wow, this is wild. That's very like, cool. We should have that. Imagine a suit. They're like, you know, hey, global warming's happening, man. Well, there's a fire. <laughs> Everybody's got their suits on. They're fire retarded. You're good. So good. I like it. I think it's really interesting what you're sharing there too because if you take a look at, you take a look at everything that we live, every waking moment, we could largely recount those things that have really changed the course of our life. Like for most people, those that list wouldn't be that long. And it's really interesting how, you know, often it's not the most influential, inspiring person. It's just the person that said that thing and when they said that. And I've recounted a number of those to you today. You know, the teacher that told us, don't do the thing that you want to do. Yeah. You know, the people that um, said that, you know, I was talented and I just had to start taking that on. Like whether it's like you'll never know who you'll meet, you know, until you ask. That's right. And you literally could meet them like in just a moment. Like it, it's incredible. We can meet them tonight, you know. Yeah. 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 And, some, and it could just be something and maybe it's that you're open to hear it at the time or it's just a, it's a point of view that you've never taken on. And often those things, it, it's so brief, you know, it's not, a full conversation it's that line that thing they said yes and there's also a thing about it you know you're like oh it's so brief and a lot of times people you don't know that well mm. and i think that's such a special thing about those new beginnings because like there's yeah. so much possibility and it's like when you go traveling is mm. the perfect like epitome of like how quick and how deep you go so quickly and you don't know yeah. them for long yeah and you may never know them again after one night mm. that's right it'll be the best one night you know <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon that happened given that we haven't been able to travel? Do you reckon that happened to people that have in their neighbourhood speaking to others that perhaps they had no true yeah relationship with so. before? Yeah. Look, I can't speak for other people, but surely I think people got more community orientated mm. to a degree, even though it was kind of like back away for quite some time. So mm. I do think there's a large population of people that got more as isolated. As a country, we got very united. Oh, mm. no, I don't think that at all. Yeah. I think by states, we've got way more divided. I think because there was this whole conversation of you guys aren't allowed to come here, which was never a thing before, yeah. right? No, it was, no, no, I just mean the people gathering together, you know, protesting. Oh, yeah, in terms of the yeah. protests of stuff like against you know, mandates and stuff. That's definitely yeah, created that's a big community mean. of people that are like-minded, mm -hmm. which, you know, you know, whichever side of the aisle you stand on, it's a good thing. Communities mm -hmm. coming together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think people standing for things is always, is good. Yeah. You know, you've got to, and also, and I've often asked myself the question, you know, what, what is it that would take me to get, get out, out on the streets? Yeah. Well, the clo closest thing was uh, the marriage equality. Yeah. Because it, well, it just means something to me in terms of, you know, the, my commitment to people being free and being able to fully express themselves. Just yeah. seemed, it just didn't make any sense that you'd people not be able to do married. that, you know? Yeah, yeah fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. yeah. No, that's beautiful. Hmm. I think we're done. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Is there anything you'd like to say? Yeah, thank you for the space you created so whatever emerged got to emerge. There were things that I talked about today that i've not talked about with other people when i got to take a look at things in a different way i got to consider why i think some things that's great so thank you for that well, you're welcome i'm glad that's that's been the case owen anything you'd like to say uh just thanks for coming on and thanks for being yourself i guess um yeah I think that's a bit. I thing. learn a lot, to be honest i always do so <laughs> <laughs> i love that because my cousin's like 19 you know like, yeah I'm so privileged that like I can have him here and be able to have conversations yeah. you know, in this kind of format where it is like, hey, let's sit down and just have a really real chat. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you for, you know, having a really real chat and, you know, letting me press you on some things and going in depth about your life. Like, I appreciate it, man. No problem. You know that I got time for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And let's play the outro. Welcome to What's Your Voyage, a podcast. That's the intro. That's the intro. <laughs> Thank God for pre-recording. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's on the wrong one. Thanks for listening or watching to What's Your Voyage. Please leave us a review on whatever podcast service you're streaming us from. You know, interact with us on social media. And thank you very much for being on the voyage. Thank you. <laughs>